Who's ready for another chapter of the Book of Romans? I actually have been a couple of days trying to get back to doing these. If you guys watch the uh, uh, chapter 10, wow. <laughs> chapter 10 is amazing. This book is super opened up to me. And I don't know why, uh, but back at the beginning when I first started doing these in December, it was a really strong urge to go through this book. Confirmation after confirmation. I mean, and just killer revelation. And what it does is it creates a sense of joy because it takes away the condemnation that the world and, and many Christians or self-professing Christians try to put on the body. And I hope these videos are blessing you guys. I hope these videos are helping people come to a, that freedom that is in Christ. Let's go through uh, chapter 11. So Romans 11, 1, uh, the name of the first 10 verses are the remnant of Israel. I say then, has God cast away his people? Now, right off the bat, the first sentence in the first verse, not even the whole verse, the first sentence is telling us, uh, answering a question of people nowadays who think that we have ex been exchanged for Israel and how that's incorrect. A lot of people think we've taken their place. No, we haven't. That's still God's people. And I've seen and heard some really bad comments about the Jews, around, about Israel. Horrible comments. And I've tried to remind a lot of people. you got to remember there's two Israels. There's the synagogue of Satan, those who have completely refused Christ and are not interested in salvation. And those that, which is funny because they were looking for their Messiah and they turned him down. And those that have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. They are walking in faith. It's the other one that we're trying to stay away from. But you have to remember that's still God's chosen people. And throughout the entire Bible, he's stuck by his people. And he's going to continue to do that. So no, we have not replaced Israel. Israel is a special people whom he's going to establish a new covenant with in the millennial reign. And we will be Christ's. We will be the, the bride, the kings, and the priests. So we're just not even one verse in and look at how right off the bat we're getting questions answered. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now he is actually a descendant. But watch what he explains here. Watch what he shows here. <clears throat> My nose is... Oof. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the saying of Eli uh, says of Elijah? What the scripture says of Elijah? He now pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. When you read in the book of Revelations, you read that Israel becomes the center of everything during the tribulation. That seven-year time frame is to deal with Israel. That's bar none. We can completely agree with that. Some people will still deny it, but whatever. <laughs> It says in there, when they start getting killed, because at a certain point, they're going to start getting wiped out. A third, a remnant, will be saved and will flee after the midway point of the tribulation and will be kept hidden. And these are ones I'm assuming are going to be Christians or those who haven't given themselves over to certain things. I don't know. But here, God has saved a certain group of people and then he's going to save a certain group of people. There will be a remnant of Israel left, and they will be brought back up as God's chosen, through what, just like it has been throughout the entire history of the world. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Some believed. He, he was one of them. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Let me change this color. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Let me read that again. Romans eleven six. 6. 
And, and again, this goes right along with what chapter 10 was telling us. It's more confirmation of what we already know and what we've been trying to tell people. And if by, since, well, they don't care for Paul's writings, but whatever. And if by grace, it is, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer of grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So he's establishing the idea. If it's by works, it's by works, not grace. If it's by grace, it's by grace, not works. You can't have both. That's serving two masters. We have people right now we've been contending with that are doing that exact thing. Whether they know they're doing it or they don't know they're doing it, I don't know. But it has fostered a great deal of hate and vitriol towards grace preachers who understand what the scriptures are saying. Verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Ooh. A chosen uh, out of Israel. What happened during Exodus? You had a whole generation of people that were stuck on, on Egypt's gods. And what did he do? And they were disobedient and everything. What did he do? Kept them out there in the wilderness until he killed them off. And got a new group up, and they went into the land. Got to pay attention to what God was doing with his people because it helps explain stuff uh, back here in the New Testament. Revelation, or Romans 11, 8, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. That's our day also. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. So throughout history, God has dealt with Israel. There has never been a time when Israel wasn't doing something dumb. And what was really silly about it is, is they knew who they were. They knew God intimately. And they still turned away. To the point that they knew their Messiah was standing before them. And they killed him anyway. Because he was going to take away their power and control. Hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. Just like God said. But he loves them. And he chose them. And he's using this to prove his power and his glory. This should give us joy. Because if he's doing it for them, what's he going to do for us who do have faith? Gentiles grafted in. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall... To provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So God, because he knew we were going to have great strong faith, some of us instantaneously, it takes very little to convince us, he's going to use us to cause Israel to turn back. And if you read through the book of Revelations, especially in chapter 7, you see this great um, deliverance of Christians. <coughs> from the tribulation so great they can't even be numbered according to John <coughs> Israel's going to see that it's going to cause more of them to be saved because they're jealous of us because of what we have we have this freedom and their Messiah which is our Messiah and it, the, the full effect of this hasn't manifested yet but it will here pretty soon Verse 12, now if their fault is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, understand what he's telling you here. Because of their fall, we have what we have. Jesus went to them, they didn't accept him. Okay, if that's what you want. But I'm going to do something here that's going to blow your minds because for thousands of years, you guys have denied the Gentile. You guys have had dealings with them, but you've kept them at bay. Now look, I'm going to go to them. Because they want me. They want to have faith in me. You don't want your Messiah? I'm standing right here in front of you. Gotcha. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to talk to these guys. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up a people. It's going to blow your mind. So, if their fault is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, so they're, they, they stumbled, we got the benefit because now we have salvation to us. How much more their fullness? If Israel does well, how much more well are we going to do? If the blessing is poured out on them greater and they do better than what they're doing, how much more will that be to us? Because when they do good, everybody's going to do good. Right now they're doing pretty good. 
The whole world is benefiting from it. Most of your inventions and your technology comes from Israel. A lot of people don't realize that. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Because he was Jewish. Verse 15, For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. So for all the people out there who are doing everything they can to discount Israel, to discount the Jewish people, you're making a big mistake. We will be walking with them. We will be serving God with them in the millennial kingdom. There are brothers and sisters because it went to them first and then came to us, to the Jew and also to the Gentile. <clears throat> now he's telling people not to be too proud. And this is something we have to watch out for as Christians. Don't be too proud. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. Do not talk smack against Israel. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Who's the root? Jesus. You can't talk smack to anyone. You will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. But do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. By nature, we don't belong. Yet, by God's grace, we were given the gift and given access. It is very important not to be high-minded about these things. But there's a lot of people, a lot of people that do. You won't even believe how many people I had to block. Verse 22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. I'm saying this because there are Christians out there, some we can name names right now, that are struggling with truth. They're, we're reaching out a hand of grace and they're smacking it away. Listen, you guys need to understand, there is only one way for salvation. No interpretation, no other way of looking at it. There is one way and one way only. We can disagree on a whole bunch of other stuff that's going to happen, but that we must agree on. Yet there's a lot of people that are saying no in order to either get saved or stay saved or a combination of them. You have to do this, do this, do that. No, it's only one thing. And then the requirement after that is walking in love. And that's not even a requirement. But that sure is a good marker of who a real Christian is. And we see a lot of people not doing that that are calling themselves Christians. They're not walking in truth. They're not walking in love. we got people calling themselves prophets and they were never designated as a prophet. And the things they said that were going to happen haven't happened. Or they're not even giving prophecies. They're just claiming a title that doesn't belong to them. Unless God comes to you or sends an angel to you and you've tested it to make sure it's from God, and tells you, hey, you're a prophet for the Lord. Here's what you're going to say. You're not a prophet. You've got to put this stuff into perspective and be adult about these things. And you certainly cannot self-elevate. Don't all the branches on the tree bear the same fruit? So, if we're all in the body, if we're all grafted into the tree... We're going to bear the same fruit that the other, the other ones bear. But if you don't, you can be cut out. If you don't bear good fruit, you can be cut out. Verse 23, And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So he's, again, here we see a confirmation about, it's, it's about belief that gets you in. But we see... If they decide to believe, he'll put them, he'll graft that natural branch back in again. Verse 24, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, 
and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? We have to understand Israel is first. A lot of people won't get what this is talking about. A lot of people won't understand what this is referring to. Basically, what's happening here, if you come to faith and you're grafted in, being a Gentile, grafted into the Jewish olive tree, if you don't continue in that faith, you can be cut out and then one of the natural branches that decides to believe can be grafted back into its spot. You have to understand how this works. <clears throat> you have to understand that they're first. It's, it's to our betterment that they're, they're first. It's not a bad thing. The mystery of Israel's salvation. Verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This is important to remember. Once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the game changes. We're raptured out of here. And then Israel gets a second lease. Don't curse them. Don't, don't look down on them. Don't cast them away. God said, if you curse them, I'm cursing you. You bless them, I'll bless you. Verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Let me read that again. Verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is God. That's his people. Don't curse his people. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So God is doing this for us. That's why we can't be high-minded about it. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. I've shared that one before as it pertains to us and it pertains to salvation. And once saved, always saved. But that also proves once they all say, but it's talking about Israel. If Israel was chosen, they're not unchosen. They're still chosen. So all the people that, that think that, get that out of your head. Romans 11 is proving it wrong. For as you were once disobedient to God, for as you were once, dis, once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Guys, God did this for us. They're going through what they're going through so we could have something. Don't get too cocky about it. Even so, these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. Remember what the Bible says, that all of creation is waiting in expectation for the sons of God to be revealed? Because once it happens, everything changes. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. This has been done for us so everybody could be saved. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Listen to what this is telling you. Even though Israel has sins, God says, I'm going to put as far as east to the west is from you. That's not just east to west on a compass on the earth. It's east to west, the whole universe. He doesn't want to hold our sins against us. He doesn't want to say, well, because you did that when you were 13, you can't come into heaven. No. Jesus died on the cross, paying the debt for the sin, once and for all, done, that's it. It's all been dealt with. Your physical sin that you are doing right now, that you are condemning yourself with and that other people are condemning you with, has no factor in your salvation. What he's looking at is the driving force behind your sin. Are you stumbling? Or are you doing it because you think you're good and you're allowed to do it? What's your driving force behind it? When you give, are you giving to look good as a Christian or are you giving because you love your brethren? That's what makes the difference between wood, hay, and stubble and gold, silver, and precious stones. Guys, what's going on here is the most amazing thing. 
And the more you dig into the truth, the more you start to develop an understanding of this. But we can't possibly understand all of it. When we are in heaven with him, then we will understand it. This is not the end. This is the beginning. But this has to happen for him to get his people established. Because what's going to go on on the other side is completely outside of our realm of understanding and is amazing. So again, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. How can I possibly judge another person's salvation? How can I possibly judge an unbeliever that God may be using for a specific purpose? I can't. I'm not the judge. Um, there's a lot of people I've blocked. I've done videos about different people. Sarah Bradley, for example. In fact, I just got a new subscriber talking about that. And and she said it just the same way I say it. I'm not doubting her salvation. I, she, I think it's a high probability she is saved. But she's deceived. And a lot of it is self-deception. And there's a lot of other people, too, that are over in these other camps that may be saved, but have gotten themselves into deception, much of it self-deception. Now, there are some people that call themselves Christians that are not saved. They have taken a title, and there's that's all it is. It's just a name tag. There's nothing underneath it. There's no substance behind it. We look for certain fruit coming from those people to give us an indicator of who we're dealing with. But the fact of the matter is, we can't look into a person's heart and tell who's saved and who isn't saved. I cannot tell you you're saved. I can't tell you your family is saved. I can't tell you anything about salvation other than it's grace through faith. And that everybody needs it. I get people asking me questions. Do you think my family's saved? I don't know. I don't know because I can't see into their heart. They may truly believe. There's a lot of people that that's all they have. They just believe. Thief on the cross. They got nothing else, but they believe. They're going to heaven. They probably won't have any rewards, but that's okay. They're still saved. Better than being in hell. <laughs> so, perspective. Got to have perspective. And got you have to understand, you are not an authority. You have been given a task and a charge to preach the gospel, get people led to salvation. After we ascend, then things change. But we got to wait until that day of redemption comes. The, the worst thing we can do is get prideful and get high-minded about who we think we are in Christ. Stay humble. Because just as quickly as you can be grafted in, you can be taken out too. That's what Romans 11 says. All right, let's go into the commentary. A remnant saved by grace. In the worst days of Hebrew apostasy, there was always an elect handful that did not go astray after other gods. It was so in the days of Elijah, and it was a comfort. Remember, it was 7,000. And it was a comfort to the faithful heart of Paul to believe that amid the generation, uh, general opposition excited by the preaching of the gospel, there were many secret lovers of the cross who were true to the Messiah and his claims. Notice he said many secret lovers. You know, every now and then they run across another underground Christian church over in Israel. A lot of people, you, to look at them, you wouldn't tell they were Christian, but they believe. That's why we can't judge anybody. I've been talking to somebody here lately about uh, about uh, some family members they've been asking about. And I actually had been given a message for that person on the way home from uh, my brother's house. And I gave him that message. When they started asking me, so do you think this is what it's saying? I don't know. It wasn't my message. That you have to go to the Lord in prayer to, to understand what that means. But here's the thing. If we're not allowed to judge the heart of another person to see whether they are saved or not, if we're not allowed to judge them according to their salvation, it's him and stuff like this here, many secret lovers, people that are in hiding, we don't know who's saved and who isn't saved. You could have a bunch of people in your life that are saved that you would never be able to tell it by their lifestyle. That's God working. That's why you got to be kind. You can't, can't judge on people. 
Man can never count these quiet, unknown, holy souls who, like the sweetest wildflowers, can be detected only by the fragrance of their lives, but God counts them, to whose grace and care all that is good in them is due. You, you can't tell somebody that they're saved or not saved, and I see people do it every single day. That's, you can't do it, just can't. The few seek and find, because they stoop to seek in God's predetermined way and along his lines. But when men set themselves against these, they become hardened and overwhelmed by a spirit of stupor. When scripture says that God gives them this, it simply means that such a state of insensibility is the working out of an inevitable law. But the apostle cherished the secret hope that the avidity with which the Gentiles were accepting the gospel would, in the mystery of God's providence, have the ultimate effect of bringing the chosen people back to him whom the fathers crucified. And even though somebody's in that spirit of stupor, like we got people over here in this other camp that we're contending with uh, all the time, even though they're in that, there still may be salvation working in that person. They may not be taken in the rapture, but they may become fully saved during the, during the tribulation. So we have to not cast too harsh of a judgment on people and keep extending that hand of grace because you never know. You just never know. And several grace preachers have talked to people and suddenly got, they became convinced. Tim Anderson talks about people come up screaming at him and then they end up saved after a 15 or 20 minute conversation. You never know. You just never know. That's why it's important for us not to lay a judgment on people. Not to lay a judgment on people. Because you just don't know what God is doing in that particular person. And he's working in everybody. Every single person. See, there should be another commentary. There we go. Others grafted in by faith. Paul never abandoned the hope that ultimately Israel would come back to God in Christ. He believed that God's promises pointed in that direction and that those through centuries might pass. Those sure guarantees would be abundantly fulfilled. Notice his expressions, how much more their fullness, in Romans eleven twelve. what shall the receiving of them be but from the dead, Romans 11.15. God is able to graft them in again, Romans 11.23. All Israel shall be saved, Romans 11.26. That he might have mercy on all, Romans 11.32. He realized, however, that Israel must temporarily make way for the ingathering of the church, in which there is neither Jew nor Greek, and that when the church has been formed and gathered to its Lord, then the time for the ingathering of the Jewish people has arrived. When is that time? Tribulation another proof of pre-tribulation rapture. Let us see to it that we Gentiles understand our position as being permitted to partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Christ was the root of that tree, and it is from his rich nature that all the freshness and fatness, all the quickening and energy, all the love and grace of the Hebrew scriptures and heritage of promises were gained. Whatever Israel had, we may have. Let us go up and possess the land. You guys got to keep in mind, and again, remember, he's doing something in people who seem to be unbelievers. Now, some people are destined to wrath. They're not ever going to believe. They've got their reward for them. But there's people he's working in that we would look at and go, I don't know if that person's saved or not. But he's doing work in them. And it may be that a time for them to have faith hasn't happened yet. And he's getting them there. He's leading them there. This is why we put our full faith and trust in him. I've prayed for all my family and friends, and now it's in his hands. I don't have the desire to go and pray for it anymore because he's already working in that stuff, and I have faith that he's working in that stuff. It's not for us to... You took a short nap. It's not for us to to choose who is and who isn't in the body or who is or who isn't saved or who is or who isn't going in the rapture. It's not our choice. It's not our call. And there may be some people that may actually find themselves on the wrong side of that uh, because of their lack of faith and because of their unbelief and their cause, because of their lack of trust. Because it's not us that's saving people, is it? It's God that's saving people. It's Christ that's saving people. If you had the ability to save people, then you'd have the call over this, but you don't. 
that God might have mercy on all. Mysteries. And this is uh, who it's, somebody's doing stuff about mysteries. Mysteries are the reasons and principles of the divine procedure which are hidden from ordinary minds, but revealed to the children of God by the Spirit, who searches the deep things. 1 Corinthians 2.10 uh, We cannot tell how near the brim we are, or when the fullness of the Gentiles will fill the predestined measure. It may be much nearer than we suppose. And then the door will be closed, and the Hebrew nation will be grafted in to serve the divine program in the last stages of human history. They are still beloved for the Father's sake, and the day is coming when all their sins will be forgiven and taken away. We may go a certain distance in the devout understanding of the ways of God, but there is a point beyond which we cannot advance, and as we gaze down into the profound abyss of the divine dealings, we must cry, O oh, the depth, Romans 11.33, the origin, the maintenance, and the ultimate end of creation, providence, and redemption is God. To him must be the glory. In other words, Hold on a second, guys. Sorry about that. A whole bunch of noise all at one time. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the depth. Romans 11, 23. The origin, the maintenance, and the ultimate end of creation. Providence and redemption is God. To him must be the glory. In other words, we shall find that the whole story of sin, redemption, and salvation will unravel and reveal the nature of God as the prismatic band of color, the sunlight. What we think we know about the plan that God has and what's being done, we, we look and we see this person's got this sin, this person, this person does this. We don't have any understanding what God is doing in that person. And in fact, in most cases, we don't understand what he's doing in us. Because in us, he's doing a work. That work is fulfilled at the day of redemption. And he will finish that work. So don't judge yourself, but certainly don't judge others. Don't look at somebody and say, you know what, that person, I see what they're doing. They, they're probably not saved, or they're not saved, or you're not going in the rapture. We have people doing that. That's not fair. That's not fair because we don't have that ability. We don't have that authority to do that. Yet people are doing it. And they're doing it quite angrily, quite nasty, um, thinking that they're doing something, thinking that they're doing good works for God. And in fact, the Bible even says that that's going to happen. They're going to kill in the saints, thinking they're doing God a service. And we see a lot of that unfolding and unraveling right now. So, don't let that be your stumbling block. Put your faith and trust in Christ. Let Him deal with those things. We pray. We come together. We worship together. We worship in our hearts. All these things, all this freedom we have is for him to work in us and to get us where he wants us. The only thing that stops that is when we let pride take over. Because then pride says, well, I don't need God. I can do this myself. No. Let pride do the work. Or let, let Christ do the work. Push pride to the side. But a lot of people are fighting with that now. That's what this world causes. A lot of pride to lift up. So that was Romans 11, guys. Again, more deep revelations, more incredible revelations coming off these pages. And I think it's just going to keep getting richer the further along we go. Because a living sacrifice, gifts of grace, marks of the true Christian, we're going to get into some heavy stuff that may tell us a whole lot about ourselves individually. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I will see you guys in the next video.